Activision versus Imagine panel, um, I have pretty much uh, a question to kind of start us off and then we'll go to questions uh, for the audience and for each panelist. I wanted to ask um, what were the, what was the specific reason or the, the straw that broke the camel's back or the reason that um, decided to uh, leave Atari essentially um, and to either join or start up your own software publisher? So we can actually start with Okay. Well, um, can you all hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess uh, part of the uh, inspiration for leaving Atari and starting Magic was that uh, actually these two guys that sit to the left of me here and one guy over, the guys at Activision had uh, you know done done so and uh, were successful at it. And uh, Atari in those days. Uh, <laughs> Uh, they were always our heroes, actually, in a lot of ways. Uh, they really were. Um, but uh, we basically, at Atari, you know, saw it grow from a very small kind of family organization, uh, very comfortable to work with, small groups. And it became kind of a mega corporation about that time when the uh, BCS really exploded, you know, in, in its volume and sales. And so uh, for me, the actual big motivation was I was a manager of the BCS um, at that time. And um, I actually kind of yearned to return to that smaller, more friendly Atari days. And so um, basically the story I tell, which is what happened, which was that I decided that uh, I would try to get Atari to fund a small group uh, outside the uh, confines of Atari. And um, I started on the business plan for that to submit to Atari and uh, got through the most of it. And I got to the sales and marketing section of it and decided I knew nothing about sales and marketing. And so I called up my good friend Bill Grubb, who was the president of Magic, you know, to, to go back. And uh, about halfway through the conversation, he was advising me on what to write in the business plan. And he said, well, why are you doing this through Atari, Dennis? He said, why don't we just go out and get some money and start a company? So that was my motivation. That's how I, I got, that's how Magic started, actually. So, Steve? Uh, why did I leave Atari? Actually, I was never at Atari. I uh, went to school down in Phoenix, Arizona, uh, back in the late 70s. It was about 120 in the shade during the daytime in Phoenix. So what you did between classes was you stayed in the student lounge and you either played pool or pinball or foosball. And uh, having played soccer in high school, I gravitated toward the foosball tables. And another guy that liked to play foosball between classes is this guy right here. And uh, so we often teamed up and played together. You could go around to uh, local bars at night and, and, and put your quarter on the table and see how long you could hold the table. Eventually it got to the point, and I remember this is long before video games. It got to the point where Dave and I ended up traveling the country uh, playing the professional foosball tournament. <laughs> I think the most we ever won was like $200. Although we did get a big and a jackpot at a tournament in Las Vegas one time. But that was a, way for a different kind of tape. So anyway, after college, Dave was working at uh, National Semiconductor. And I interviewed there and got a job doing a lot of soldering. Again, this is before software. Uh, Dave and Al started up Activision. And Dave said, hey, we know this guy. We can train this game designer. If he can't do it, he can always do our hard for us. <laughs> so I uh, thought that into business. <laughs> Well, we're doing this out of chronological order. Um, so we go back a couple of years before Magic, and we had a similar um, similar story that Dennis was telling. Atari wasn't a fun place to work anymore. And it started out with Nolan, and it was his dream, his baby, and, and that was a small groups. So everybody was kind of working together. But Nolan sold to uh, Warner Communications for X number of millions of dollars, and they brought in the management teams. And in fact, you'll, you'll see uh, some of the, well, I hope you hear some of the stories, not from me, because they're not fun stories to tell, but the, some of the things that the management did back there were really absurd. And um, Al and I, and uh, two other guys, Larry Kaplan and Bob Whitehead, we were generally just kind of a group that worked together, we go to lunch together and such. And at that point, we were thinking, this is ridiculous, we can do this on our own. And you know, ended up spinning off from Atari and starting Activision. Probably the number one impetus was a memo that was circulated by marketing that showed the previous year's sales of video 
in cartridges. And ranking them number one, number two, number three, and they actually put the percentage of the dollar sales up, and they didn't put the dollar sales up, they didn't want to tell us how much money our cartridges were making for them. But it was pretty easy because Atari had done $100 million in cartridge sales the previous year, so we were looking pretty easy to divide from $100 million if you're 10% of that, you know how much that was. So. so the four of us were sitting there with this memo, and we, you know, marked off the games that we had done, and we realized that the four of us, making about $30,000 a year, had done $60 million in a single year of sales of cartridges for Atari. And we just looked at each other and said, why don't we do this for ourselves? <laughs> And um, you know, that's basically what we did. And basically, you know, Dennis and the people who ended up starting the Magic were the next group. They had done 40% of the games that were done by Atari. So we left, and then they followed shortly thereafter. Now you can do all the negative stuff that happened. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dave alluded to the fact that, uh, that Norman Bushnell, who was the founder of Atari, sold the company in late 76 to Warner Communications, which became, which is now AOL Time Warner. Uh, and unfortunately, about a year after they sold it, they sort of kicked Nolan out. Nolan you know, knew the business. They brought in a new guy named Ray Kassar, who just absolutely didn't know squat. Um, didn't appreciate the complexity of what we did. In his first meeting with the Consumer Electronics Group, which included all of the all of the hardware engineers who laid out the PC boards as well as created the, the very complex for that time uh, custom semiconductors needed to support the products and the software people. Um, somebody asked him what he knew about managing creative people, and because we all fancy ourselves as pretty creative. And he said, well, I've dealt with creative people all my life, and towel designers, for example. So that, that was a real bad sign to us, that people were you know, very experienced semiconductor design people, software design people, and power designers, who we did not hope in high regard. Um, so that was sort of the beginning of the end, I think, of one of our uh, enjoyment of working at Atari. Uh, Dave and I and a couple other people uh, were shifted out of the games group at one point to begin working on the operating system for the 400 800 computer. And after we completed that, I had, I had spent you know, perhaps four or six months working on that project. And it gave me time to reflect on what I wanted to do with the company. And I wanted to do game design rather than operating system design. And I researched other creative industries like music and uh, writing novels and came up with what I thought was a fair contract for continuing my occupation at Atari as a game designer. And it reflected a relatively modest royalty rate and uh, getting a creative uh, mention for what I had done. I wanted to be credited with my work. I drafted the contract, submitted it to my boss, who in turn submitted it to his boss, and I began the negotiation process with the target manager to, uh, to become uh, compensated in a way that other creative authors are compensated. At some point, I explained to Dave and Bob and Larry Kaplan uh, what I was doing, and we all sort of formed a little nexus to continue those discussions with Atari management. And although our boss, George Simcock, who's a nice guy, gave us every indication that Atari was going to make some accommodation for our request, which was very, very modest, uh, ultimately Atari management uh, decided not to do anything in that regard. They said, nope, we're just going to keep working here $30,000 a year. Well, we met with that President Ray Kassar on one occasion, and he looked us in the eye and he said, you are no more important to this product than the person on the assembly line who puts it together. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think that was, Atari had become brain dead underneath Kassar's management. It wasn't a fun place to work. We had a lot of concerns about where the company was going, and indeed, the target didn't even pull open after a few more years. So that, that was the reason why I wanted to even start a new company. Well, I come from a completely different place. I, I was probably hired to replace these guys at Atari. I was hired on an Atari in early 1980, just after they had left. 
So I, I buckled down. This was my first job in the game industry. I had sold the game before, but had uh, had never actually worked at a, at a company. So Dennis hired me. I did video pinball, and that was about time Dennis decided he was ready to go. He liked pinball and said, why don't you come along with me? So I was right there. I, I had the same cynicism about Atari management. Seemed like the VPs were mostly guys with good hair. And, uh, it, it got laughable, and I was, I was ready and eager to fall in this. <laughs> yeah, I want to clarify. My concerns had nothing to do with the technical management. Well, I, uh, I guess I came about two years later in the timeline after these guys had done the hard work of, of starting up uh, a magic. And uh, uh, my point of entry into this whole industry was uh, I'd been wargaming and uh, having fun with miniatures and other uh, uh, kinds of board games all my life. And Willie and I had played a lot of games as uh, uh, we worked together in this ad agency print shop. Uh, and I was just getting completely burned out on the sound of printing presses. And so uh, it was about January of uh, 82 now that I saw this great article in Time Magazine on the cover about uh, uh, how the, the new big uh, deal was going to be uh, coin out to video games. And so I just made a New Year's resolution to get the heck out of uh, the ad agency business. And uh, uh, two months later, I found a, an ad in the, the Chronicle, just a little bit about this company of magic, and I had no idea what uh, the video game uh, industry was, but I uh, got persuaded to go do an interview and uh, uh, brought a bunch of print samples, and the only thing they, they wanted to hang on to were a couple of board games I worked with uh, William on. So, then I got a call back to meet with Bill Grubb and got uh, uh, asked if I put together the packaging part of, uh, of the art department. And uh, in passing, they said, oh, by the way, yeah, we're just not crazy about the artwork that programmers do. So uh, could, could you, since you're a, an artist kind of guy, could you do pixel graphics? And I said, oh, sure, I guess I can do that, too. So uh, little did I realize what that was going to become in this industry, but uh, at that time, uh, I'd be able to take a Atari 800 and Bob and uh, Rob Phillips software home for the weekend and uh, pretty much bang out all the graphics for a game uh, over two days and bring them back in. Uh, uh, but as time went on, we got to work uh, more and more with uh, with the designers and kind of get uh, enmeshed in that. And I, I realized taking a, a product to the trade show that since I was working for marketing, they had no idea which games were doing well and which ones weren't. And I'd, uh, I'd say, well, listen, I didn't want to put that one in the brochure because the programmer hasn't shown up for two weeks. I don't think it's going to get finished in time. Uh, and I realized that really where the action was was with engineers and kind of making the product. So I, I switched over there and got to become a creative director, whatever that was in our industry, and uh, started working uh, in the trenches uh, making product. And uh, that just continued uh, for me uh, through uh, uh, Magic to uh, PF Magic, uh, which was kind of a coincidence. That was the, uh, the, the catchphrase of uh, pure fucking magic that uh, <laughs> when something worked for some unknown reason in software. And after doing that with Rob for a few years, came over to EA and uh, have continued making games uh, up until the present. So that's been my story. But I really got to thank Rob for mentoring me and explaining how the heck software worked. So I had a clue enough to kind of make stuff for him. Yeah, to echo that, um, I really thank all these guys for creating this industry and uh, giving the opportunity for creative people to express themselves in a new way. So, like Mike was saying, we were doing traditional commercial art, comic books, th you know, just to be totally honest, anything to make a buck. It's, you know, your commercial art, it's a, it's a rough uh, uh, living when you're starting out. So, uh, Michael and I have been, we were friends from 1975 on. And uh, we worked together for a while, then he went off, and then I went off to start my own little studio, and 
he gives me a call one day. He goes, "Hey, man, I got this uh, really cool gig. It's uh, you know doing this all this uh, packaging and stuff for a video game company." And I, I knew what video games was, but I didn't really know what he was talking about. And I was thinking, "Well, you know, I got this studio going, and it's I'm finally you know making uh, you know maybe you know five thousand a year, so it's going pretty good." And, and uh, he goes, well, you need to come down here and check it out. So we went down there, and really we started out as just a commercial artist, doing all the, the you know, the, the manuals and the packaging and the point of purchase, just doing traditional art. And then hooking up with Rob and uh, Dennis and uh, a variety of other, and, and of course Bob, uh, we just, you know, we became friends. And uh, like they were saying, the graphics at that time, all the, the engineers did all their graphics. It was pretty simple. But then, you know, they wanted to have little characters running around, uh, more elaborate scenes, backgrounds. You know, uh, you know, they were more involved in uh, code than worrying about color theory of what colors, you know, work well. Even though it was cyan, orange, and you know, uh, white and black to create flesh. You know, so they, you know, it was, hey, do you think you can help us do these things? And we would draw like on. Um, on a graph paper, or we would uh, put acetate on a screen and sketch it on the screen, and then they would figure out how to put pixels down. And then they said, well, we'll give you tools. Uh, do you think you can use them? We go, sure. <laughs> you go, uh, do you have them? No, we'll go write something. And so they came back, the first tool I remember was on the 400, I believe, and it was on called, it was, or 800? It was on the 800, it was called Draw. <laughs> <laughs> And you would take the, the pixel <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and you would just plunk, take a joystick and you plunk them down, you know. And, but we've got line by line color, so that was pretty good. Uh, then the next thing when we wanted to do animation, uh, uh, you know, we weren't really animators, we kind of figured it out. It's flipbook stuff, and the next tool is called Move. <laughs> And uh, that really was the beginning, and it was on, you know, now uh, at EA, you know, I'm, I'm uh, you know, working with kids that get computer graphic degrees and stuff, and I'm thinking, boy, that's a lot different than the way we started. We just learned as we went, and we told these guys, you know, this is what the tool needs to do, and they go off and fix it. And it was a, just a dynamic, very exciting time. Um, we were able to crank out games left and right through the, you know, every six months. <laughs> yeah, it's not more. And we would do a lot of stuff that would never, never hit the, you know, uh, hit the production floor. But uh, it was a very exciting time, and I really owe debt of gratitude to these guys for making the industry what it is today. And a lot of kids now that are working in the industry don't know, you know, the, the, the foundation that has been set. And I'm really glad for this. Uh, uh, conference to, to maybe get that word out and give these guys their due. So, because I, I am uh, very grateful for that. Sort of a target dead now, serves a right kind of attitude, but 
that what, you know, it's not reasonable, but how do you feel about Atari going the way of the dinosaur and Japan basically dominating the video game industry now as far as console? I'm not right on that, especially when you start thinking that we have to have concept approval from Sony before Sony will even let us start a game for the PlayStation. I've never liked that. But of course, you know, Atari sued all of us as soon as we started our company. They sued us because they you know, didn't want us doing that. I didn't care much for that either. Imagine props. <laughs> it's, it's a darn shame because the industry was founded really by Atari. Mattel was very early on. Fairchild was early on. Founded by an American company here in California. And they all evaporated. They all did not have the long-term confidence that this was going to be an important industry. They did a road, they did a Rocky patch around 8384. And Warner Bale, I mean, Warner sold the company out to Jack Camille. And Mattel gave up on it. So, you know, it's so embarrassing to see these American companies just give up on the concept of interactive entertainment when all of us knew this was going to be huge. And the Japanese companies really should be applauded because they, they continue to invest in the industry. But I, I wish we had more important American companies in the business. Well, also, you know, the other thing to consider is, you know, I really do think Nintendo has to be applauded for basically reinventing the video games business. So, you know, that when the conventional wisdom was when they came out with their 8-bit console, that this was the stupidest thing that most people had ever heard of. You know, that, that they how could they come out with a console in a business that was clearly dead? And Nintendo had the foresight and to basically, uh, you know, stick with it, and uh, they came out with great games, and eventually, uh, you know, basically rebuilt the business for all of us. You know, and a lot of us are still working in the business today, and it's really, you know, you got to thank Nintendo for that. I mean, uh, I think it is a little sad that we didn't have the foresight to stick with it. You know. Uh, I miss um, Mattel and Atari. But even though the Japanese companies uh, dominate the hardware platform, they don't necessarily dominate the software. No, they don't. These guys down here on the end are the most successful software company. Yeah, but uh, ironically, uh, the situation hasn't changed much. Uh, I mean, the, the pay scale is a little more than when you guys are making 30000 but, uh, you know, there, there's no royalties in the industry now, and, uh, you know, like I worked on the Red Rings games and watched me and make about a half a billion dollars, you know, just goes, goes right into the corporate offers. Uh, uh, so you, you have to do it because you enjoy doing it, because uh, there's there's no way to get real rich quick anymore in the industry. It's kind of the way it's managed. It's not for a lot of uh, creative uh, and contributor of something. We have a question way in the back. Um, what predictions do you guys have for the gaming industry? If any. <laughs> there's a hard one. The future is plastics. <laughs> Interestingly enough, I think that there are more games being played today that are like the classic games, which we now call them casual games. You play a lot online. Uh, Skyworks, the company that Alan and I work for, um, we do a lot of casual games. And, and it's because it's very much like what we used to do at Atari. We, we enjoy the, the little, you pick it up, you play it for a little while. Uh, typically, people play on their computer at, the, at their desk because they don't want to respond to that email they just got. You know, they don't want to think about it or whatever. So they'll shoot a game of golf or they'll play a game of billiards. And it's interesting because that that's now called classic game or casual gaming, and um, you get probably 30 times as many people playing those kinds of games as playing the uh, hardcore console games. That is the future of video gaming right now. I think, that, I think the big boys are still looking for the fusion of, of gaming and, and movies. That's, that seems to be with, with all the new hardware advances. And now, you don't dare publish a PlayStation 2 game without the proper graphics and shadowing and special effects and so on. I just I, uh, I see it being driven that way. That's why I'm happy working with these guys. <laughs> well, I, I personally see, well, I'll put in my two cents worth here, too, and I think Dave's right in the sense that uh, the casual gaming, and he, he neglected to mention the most important aspect, which is, uh, you know, the advent of cell phones and smartphones and all those things that are, you know, we're just starting to see the tip of the iceberg right now on that. And, uh, you know, uh, working in those areas myself, I can tell you without telling you what about some of the really exciting things that are going to be coming in the next year to, you know, in terms of hardware and design platforms and things like that. And I think that the casual gaming experience that uh, Dave is talking about is indeed probably the future of the mass gaming, you know, and on portable devices. You know, people play it 
wherever, whenever they have a few minutes, you know, they want to play a simple game, have a little bit of fun, be entertained. And I think that is, uh, now there's going to be the other niches, you know, there's going to be the intense console experience, you know, the new generation of consoles that are coming. I happen to be a big fan of MMORGs, you know, EverQuest 2, uh, Worlds of Warcraft, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm an intense player in those areas, so I'm a big fan of those. But those are more niche markets, you know, compared to uh, mass gaming, so. I have a comment on that, too. I think uh, over the next 10 years, we're going to see interactive entertainment become dominated by advertising supported entertainment, much like uh, the movie and TV business is dominated by broadcast television and some stuff by advertising. So that, that, I believe, very strongly will become the biggest part of interactive entertainment. We'll still be able to go out and buy games at retail, but uh, most consumers will be happy just to play advertising supported games well, I think just just to uh, put one more point on it, uh, you'll you'll see the portable casual gaming as a large uh, large aspect of, of what's accessible to everybody all the time, and uh, is not terribly intrusive, so you can take it with you anywhere and play uh, and entertain yourself anywhere. And, and I think that you'll also then. Uh, see this offshoot that will have uh, you know, big money behind it and uh, big uh, rewards for it, which is the creation of virtual reality. So it'll be both online and sort of uh, solo centric. And I, I think that's where the kind of the, the movie experience will fuse with, with a virtual reality experience. But the truth is, those games are incredibly expensive to make. It takes huge teams to, to create these days. And uh, you're probably going to see the price of those and increasingly go up as time goes on just because that's the only way to make any money off of them. But I, I think you'll probably see both of those styles of interactive entertainment persist over the next day. So we sure narrowed down the future for you, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I will say that the, the development of the games is going to be one of the most crucial aspects and it'll be interesting to see how that develops because it will creep into the creative aspect of the, those games. So they'll need to be supported with advertising and the, the teams, I mean, uh, I've I'm on a team now, it's over 200 people to make the game. So um, I'm not saying that's the future, but when you look at next gen, which we, I've been working on development of the next gen for 360 and uh, soon to be uh, uh, PS3, uh, just the expectation of being able to play a, a game that looks like Toy, Toy Story or Shrek, that is what the market's going to demand. And uh, we'll have to see how the development of that will, you know, will, will ripple through the actual creative uh, output of these games. This question in the middle, sorry. Yeah. Um, if you can imagine having young kids who are like 18 years old or so, and they said, hey, you know, I'm thinking about a career in computer science gaming type field, uh, would you be enthusiastic for them? And what would you say their life might be like in five to 10 years in that, in that field if they had decided to go into it? What would you tell them about their life might be like? There's been huge turmoil in the video game development industry the last two or three years about quality of life issues associated with being a designer and an artist in the industry. There is vast dissatisfaction inside the game development community about their quality of life, about their level of compensation. It's a killer industry to work in. It will run your way. Well, I'd like to think, and I'd like to, to say to anybody coming in, I think the trick is to find ways to put fun back into the industry and not turn it into a sweatshop, to kind of recapture, I think, the joy we all had in like working together with our buddies and making neat stuff. And uh, the, the more it becomes an assembly line, the, the less you're going to have with that and the more numbing the whole experience is going to be for people that want to be creative. So I'd encourage them to try to find ways to invent old new paradigms of, of doing creative together because I think that's the only way you're going to keep really good uh, sharp people in the industry in the long haul. Just a recommendation, uh, there's the International Game Developers Association, IGEA.org. Um, I strongly recommend anybody who's interested in the occupation of profession, go check out uh, our association. Um, question over here. Hi. Um, when you guys were, were coding back in the day, you were doing game designs and sound and coding and the graphic sound. Um, when you fired up to, to get the, uh, your other companies, um, and you, some of you really brought personality to the games and, and became sort of celebrities in that sense, did you change the way you work? Did you prefer to move into just coding and, and then start to delegate the tape for pieces of design? And which was the most comfortable way of working for you? 
I don't think we, we overly specialized until a few years later, and then it was really divided cleanly between, you know, here's your art guy, here's your sound guy, uh, here's your asset person. Um, we did do all of it until Mike McGurley came along. Yes, we, we were, I worked out of a, a quad notebook, and I have, you know, half a dozen notebooks that are full of little tiny filled-in squares that were all my graphics. Um, we didn't specialize in, in, until we'd all moved on, I think, we, with the exception of, of art. Uh, we never did, at Magic at least, we never did have a lot, a lot of sound support. We had, you know, some people who were good with it, but we didn't have a sound department, we say. Did you find it more rewarding of the, the whole? I like doing it all. I actually like working by myself, but that's that's me. You know, I, I built myself a house because I wanted to build myself a house. I built sailboats in the 70s because I wanted to sail. So, you know, it was kind of, it was, that's kind of my style. And I, I, do, I do like working by myself. I know my art isn't as good, nearly as good as these guys, but I'm really good at flying play with it. You know, it's programmer's art, essentially. <laughs> that's, that's really, it's a quality issue. Uh, when the games were 2K bytes, um, an artist could use 2K bytes on a single scene. We couldn't do that. We had to have all of the game programming, all of the art, all the sound effects in that tiny little thing. So it really helped to be in one brain, the amount of assets you were going to apply to the programming into the, uh, the art. And as the projects continued to get bigger, obviously you now have the freedom. And it's easy to find a person who does art better than me. It's easy to find a person who does sound effects better than me. So we would end up, you know, as it evolved, it evolved into slightly larger team, simply because of quality. I could get better. Work. Now, at the time that we only had, um, we had situations back in Atari where we went and got the arts and said, OK, I got a slot machine game. And I did all the art for the slot machine game. And the slot machine game has things like cactus on it. Well, why is it cactus? Because cactus can be done in four pixels and look like a cactus. Um, so the marketing department said, here's an artist. Have them do a cherries for you. You know the cherries? And they came back and they said, OK, well, what do we got? And I gave them the quad rule paper. And I said, you can color in a square or not. <laughs> <laughs> and then you had eight by eight. Yeah. And they, like I had two heads, and they, they tried to make this thing look like cherries. And it was a box here, and a box here, and a box here, and two pixels for stems. So you couldn't even bring an artist in to do something like that. At some point, at least, we gave them 16 bits, and we gave them line by line color, as was mentioned. And, and so you could start to see how you can add some, some talent to that. But in the really small games, there was no way to use that. Now, on the other hand, what we found over time was those people who had proven the ability to do all of the disciplines going into a game. I mean, we're talking about from a light sheet of paper coming up with a game concept, writing every line of code, doing every piece of graphics, all the sound effects, putting it all together into a final package. Those people turned out to be the George Lucases and the Steven Spielbergs, who knew what it looked like to look through a camera, even though he wasn't the cameraman, who knew how to set up a set, even though he wasn't the set guy. So if you had a person who had actually done it all, leading a team of experts who were much better at their individual discipline, you ended up with a much better product. So that's really the way it evolved over time. I think one of the, um, it, much has been, been made of um, Mr. Miyamoto over at Nintendo who did Donkey Kong and things like that. He, uh, I think one of his sort of unsung attributes was that um, he actually, all of the, you know, the, the, the dot pixel animations uh, for Donkey Kong. Um, and he, 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 he drew a lot of those first before he designed like the artwork on the packaging and things like that. So I think I, that ability of, of him being able to work with that, that had a lot to do with the success of, of that game. You know, I think we have a question in the middle here. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. I'm just curious. Um, looking at your, both of you, uh, both groups of you left um, Atari to start your own company because of dissatisfaction. And then I think the last question, we were talking about dissatisfaction in the current industry. I'm wondering, do you see a similar, do you see, or are we right for the picking for another um, a Magic and another um, Activision? And if so, where do you see it coming from or any anything like that? I think you actually are seeing it now. Uh, I left uh, Electronic Arts a few years ago to join a little startup doing cell phone games. And the big draw there was, hey, I could go back, design the game, write the code, do the graphics, implement the sounds, and be
be done in three months. So in a way, it's, it's kind of taken a step back to the way it was 20 years ago. And since the resources are somewhat limited, uh, we're getting back to the point where, okay, we don't have six, 600 megabytes of disk to fill up with graphics and sound and movies. We better make a, figure out a way to make it fun to play. So the way it has gone back to that. And I, I would say also on our little group, we have a group up in the Grass Valley in that city area. We have about five people currently, and we do a variety of projects. And uh, we've made a conscious effort in the last few years to stay small, to, to be, you know, to, to basically be a small little group, kind of like it was back in the era of the Atari and Magic days. And uh, are we going to, you know, uh, become the next, uh, uh, you know, a magic or Activision or anything? The answer is clearly not. You know, I mean, the emphasis is all on the blockbusters these days and the big names and the, you know, huge development teams and all the rest of it. And uh, But at the same time, uh, you do have to make that personal decision, you know, uh, as you know, we indicated before, you know, your personal lifestyle choice, you know, what, you, what you're happy doing, you know, you know, all the rest of it. I mean, it's kind of exciting for, for Willie to be working on The Godfather, for instance, or Mike would be working on Lord of the Rings, but they paid a price for that. And they pay a big price for that. And uh, so it's just a, a trade-off. I don't think there are any opportunities for that to happen in the big retail game business because you need a $10 million development investment. You need a at least a $10 million marketing investment. And, and guys can't just start a little company to do that. But there are emerging areas of gameplay. Steve mentioned cell phone games. There's the download game market right now where there are a bunch of studios starting up uh, publishing their own games that are distributed online, typically 5 to 15 megabytes in size, and they can be for a few, a few months. So there are opportunities for new startup companies. There are a lot of development groups doing that, but not, they can't compete against EA, they can't compete against Sony or anything. Well, I think it'll happen for a console book, I see. Now, I have a hope that, uh, and I don't know, we'll see how it plays out in the next couple of years, uh, because of what, uh, Microsoft is doing the 360, where they're not going to a, a, a bigger disk size, and I'm wondering if that, in the back of their mind, is almost like consciously trying to create two categories of, of game development over time, where you have like the big blockbusters that are done on the Sony and with the mega budgets, but you have a little more modest fit on a regular CD size games that are done more with off-the-shelf PC tools that creates a sort of boutique or, or indie market for software publishers within the Xbox realm. If so, it's a clever strategy because I think that there's a lot of developers groups that don't want to get tied in the, the corporate politics of, of getting a big budget project through that might uh, find another avenue. And, and I wonder also with the uh, connectivity of the internet uh, to consoles in the years to come if uh, uh, as we're going to see with movies, the downloading of digital content is going to obsolete the old packaged goods distribution where the EA and a few huge companies hold you know, complete monopoly over the worldwide marketplace. So, you know, the glacier will shift in some ways over time as these innovations kick in. Um, I'd like to hope, being an optimist, that there'll be a niche where uh, more independent creatives can do a smaller scale, kind of intimate and richer interactive experiences, and it doesn't have to be an either or of just the, uh, the, the kind of the portable game or the, the mega game, but there's a middle ground where we can find innovation here. That'd be my dream. Uh, did you have a question? Yes. Are you guys amused that the uh, continuing development on systems such as the Intellivision and the uh, Atari 2600? I find it. I find it personally uh, somewhat hard to believe. <laughs> um, I kind of got got over the point of being totally amazed by all the people sitting out here in the audience. But uh, you know, I guess it's like most human endeavors that you know, there people have all the kind of hobbies you could possibly imagine, and you guys are all obviously interested in classic gaming business. Uh, for, uh, it just amazes me personally. You know, it's uh, it's kind of gratifying that people remember it and uh, all the rest of them are still interested in it. But it's uh, it's amazing. Me. Uh, Dennis, you got to remember, doing a game on the 2600 was more fun than anything we do today. <laughs> it was the most challenging technologically to do something cool on that horrible hardware. I mean, you patted yourself on the back almost every single day. <laughs> the other thing I learned from these 
these guys is uh, I, I think that kind of software is the most elegant, kind of the most like a haiku or a kind of kind of condensation of fun and a reduction of it to kind of the barest essentials of you know what is the input device, you know, and what is gratifying, and then kind of strip away all the layers and words and fancy pictures and kind of find a heart of fun with as few elements as possible. And I think there's an appeal to that that gets lost with the flesh of a lot of games now. And those guys, these guys found it. I marvel how they did. <laughs> um, you got a, a question in the back person? So, yeah. You, sir. Yes. Oh, I, had a, I was curious about the 2K games. Besides the obvious selections like uh, boxing or whatever, how did you come up with your game ideas? Wow. Um, there's nothing magic about it. I mean, there's only a few that really have a story. Uh, Freeway, for example, was a game. Um, a chicken crossing ten lanes of traffic. Uh, we go, used to go to a trade show every year, uh, CES in Chicago. And I was on the bus going to the trade show when some idiot was trying to cross ten lanes of traffic on Lakeshore Drive. <laughs> you just look at that and said, that could be a video game. <laughs> <laughs> but basically, I worked a little differently than most people. Um, when I finished a game, there's a sort of a decompression. What would you used to call it? Post cartridge depression? <laughs> it wasn't really a depression, it was just a, a decompression where you just kind of fool around. You play the other guy's games, you know, try not to get heavily into something because the end of a game is so intense, getting all the last details in, all the bugs fixed, and, and squeezing it down into that size ROM was very intense work. So you just kind of relax. You just hung around, you played games, and that sort of thing. But what I would then do, my next step, would be taking the 2600 and starting from scratch, trying to figure out some new way to make it do something that its designer never intended. Um, figuring out a way to, I mean, the, the car in Grand Prix, is a technological achievement that, I mean, it's, it's baffling to actually make that thing that size, have two tires on each, you know, four tires, two on each side of the car, have the colors on the car, all of those things, and then they have that huge thing disappear off the screen on both sides. Because what you don't realize is if I didn't do that, when it stuck out the right side of the screen, it would come back on the left. It was an automatic hardware wrapper. So I was actually making the car go like this. <laughs> Chopping and slicing it up as it went by. And doing all that and having you know multiple tires and all that kind of stuff, it was a nightmare. I spent months, probably two months, just making the car. And then once I did that, of course, it had to be a car racing game because I had a car now, you know. <laughs> so a lot of times the technological achievement that I came up with led directly to a type of game. Um, so it wasn't that difficult. You just sit around and saying, gee, this would be fun. Let's do this. And, and, and I will say also, just that, you know, this is supposed to be a uh, Activision versus a Magic. Uh, one of the one of the friendly rivalries that we have between our two companies. So we all know each other pretty well and everything. But one of our biggest goals in Magic, and I kind of think it probably was at Activision. I've never heard it in set. But we would go to the CES shows to show our new products, and and one of our our you know it was great that we sold a lot of stuff and, and all that sort of stuff was good. But what really was important to us was showing David Crane or Al Miller some technique in a game and challenging them to figure out how to do it. <laughs> They would do the same for us, I'm convinced. And uh, that well, wasn't the best part of CES. Yeah. 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 You've seen it was on figuring out how they probably Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and that was that was a lot of fun to do that. And, uh, now tell us about the six-digit score kernel you used. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Stolen I'll right out of the Activision <laughs> realm. really uh, pretty fun. I mean, that was what, you know, that's the, the level of, of where we were at then. I mean, it was like, you know, it was like, uh, oh, I, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll do something cool and, you know, show you that and they'll shoot do something cool. And it was really fun. I was thinking of, of a story earlier, just to give you an example. Uh, I was really heavily into uh, listening to a new group back in those days, a group of the name of Boingo Boingo. Mm -hmm. Danny Altman became a big famous, you know, screen film composer. Uh, and we had a brash young artist who came to work for us, the guy that down down at the very end there, Willie Aguilar, and he was talking about this new artist that he was really into, this guy by the name of Prince. Never heard of this guy before, you know. And uh, it was that kind of a fun 
sort of day-to-day -day sort of thing that we did. You know, we listened to music. We were playing each other's games. We were just had a, it, it was a great camaraderie. Um, it was just a lot of fun, you know. The, the business was secondary. It was just having fun was the main thing, you know. And, uh, and I had forgotten, actually, until David mentioned it. It was fun and it was challenging to work on those things. And, uh, and um, yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, hard to capture that today. It really is. So, to other people. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you know, the thing is, uh, I, uh, you know, when I started with these guys, I was the young, you know, the young artists coming in, and now, of course, I'm the old. Uh, uh, you know, uh, as I call myself, the token Nicaraguan pixel artist. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you, you know, so I have these stories, and I try to tell a lot of the younger artists the stories that, of all this stuff, of what, you know, you know how I used to work, how we work with these guys, we'd hang out. We'd be working late, but because we wanted to, not because we wanted to, you know, show our boss that we were there. Or make a quarter. Yeah. <laughs> or make a quarter, yeah. And so uh, it's kind of like that saying, the bumper sticker, you know, um, think uh, uh, globally, act globally. What I try to do is with my group is try to capture that kind of excitement, that kind of camaraderie, that kind of fun within my group. Because I can't, I mean, you know, I work at a huge company and there's no way I can, you know, uh, affect everybody. But I do try to do that within my team. And th that's the only way you can capture it now. It's, it's challenging because, you know, it's, it's a big group. But, uh, um, I do remember those those days pretty well, a little foggy, but fairly <laughs> uh, And, uh, you know, I think, uh, I, I wish we could capture that again and have that so when people came to work, it was because they really wanted to and, and, and you know, do things as a kid then. I'd like to make one comment about the game idea, and that is that the arcade stand-up business started in 72. The programming of the game started in 77, so the arcade people deserve a great deal of uh, recognition because they were five years so we copy a lot of their games. They, they might hear the way for us in many respects. But they, they design games differently than most of us. He started with a graphic concept. Most of us started with a game concept. So it's a very different approach. How did you do it, Steve? I usually stole what you were working on. <laughs> <laughs> well, we hired Steve. Um, we, it was very, a very difficult thing to do because we had four guys. We worked together well at Atari. We worked together well at Activision. And we had seen groups self-destruct from size. You bring in other people and you don't have the same group synergy. So um, and we had to hire people who were going to grow the company. So we had to figure out a way. So I went to my old football partner. And he had to, actually, you came to me. Uh, I don't know what the, we were, how we got together. But he said, hey, you know that skiing game you guys did? You could change that the skier to a kayak and change the trees to rocks and put a blue stripe down the middle and you've got a whitewater river rafting or kayaking game or something like that. And you know, it's actually not a bad idea. <laughs> so actually that's how Steve started, is he took games that we'd already done and that's how he learned. He'd never written a program in his life, never designed a game in his life. And, but by taking stuff that we had done and recasting it, it gave him a good starting point, and then he branched on from there. And then just stole arcade games. <laughs> Anybody ever seen Mega Mania? <laughs> I was sitting in Chuck E. Cheese. <laughs> With a pocket full of quarters playing Blaster. Astro Blaster. Astro Blaster. With my pad and pixel paper copying what I saw. <laughs> <laughs> and we ended up hire, or, uh, interviewing the point out designer of Astro Blaster to do become a game designer at Activision. And we made Steve come into the interview. <laughs> and I never once, never once even said, and you copied my game. <laughs> nice of <one>. yeah. <laughs> I think we had other questions on the back. Um, I think all, all the way in the back there. I don't know. Yeah. Um, it sounds like Atari sued both Magic and Activision after you guys split. What was what were they suing you guys for? What was the output? The Atari secrets. After you guys respond, bullshit is the answer. They were tossed out. Our our suit was tossed out of court on the first day. It, you know, it was just patently ridiculous. You know, it was basically both for you, both for you. You know, so judge just go away. It was just to obstruct the process of a competitor. And um, you know, the Activision Atari suit was suddenly for nothing. 
think Dennis had any pressing story about this? Oh. <laughs> um, that is actually built into the business plan? Oh, yeah. We actually, uh, as part of the magic, uh, we, we knew full and well we were going to be sued the instant we started the company. And, uh, you know, that was part of our budget item. It was a line budget item, you know, for X amount of dollars for lawyers, you know. And, uh, and you know, as expected, we were sued and all the rest of it. Um, the funny part of it, I guess, the part I didn't tell um, uh, our moderator there was the, uh, I had actually appeared in many lawsuits for Atari, representing Atari, against other companies prior to that, since I was, you know, manager of the video computer system for a while. I worked a couple of years in coin op, I worked in electronic handbells, all those areas. And so many times I was brought in as a star witness or an expert witness or as, a, you know, on the other side of the coin. And actually that turned out to be pretty beneficial when we got sued because I kind of knew all the parties' trade secrets and how they went about their lawsuits and everything. And I knew all the lawyers involved, actually, for that matter. Um, so it was kind of interesting, you know, how that all could played out. But, you know, ultimately it was just, like they say, business instruction type, you know, lawsuit you know, sort of thing. Magic and Activision were both funded by experienced venture capital companies, and, and just like Dennis mentioned, Activision had a line budget to defend against the lawsuit, which the investor said this is surely going to happen. So it's not a surprise. Not a surprise at all. And I was the first one deposed in the Activision lawsuit, and their lawyers had been told that we were scum, that we had stolen trade secrets, and the only way we could do this was that we'd stolen this kind of stuff. So they really believed it, and they came at us with a vengeance. After about six hours of deposition, the guy started, he ended up changing his tack. He finally realized that we were properly coached before we left. We left everything behind. We didn't take any, we didn't take a pencil, you know. And uh, so his questions were like, and you guys didn't take any work papers either, right? And I said, right, you know. He had basically finally realized there was nothing there. He had been fed a bill of goods. But there is one somewhat good thing that came out of being sued by Atari. Uh, yes, yes. Um, I met my wife. <laughs> she was the court reporter. <laughs> she was not the reporter for my deposition, but she was for Brad Stewart and Michael Renz and our union. <laughs> There's Brad. <laughs> you know, speaking of Brad. Yeah, Brad's first day at Adam Matthew was in court. <laughs> while he was at Atari. We had gone, he was still at Atari, and they did something that I thought had to have been illegal. But they were trying to determine whether or not, looking at our program listings, which we had to provide in discovery, we had to provide the first program listing, the second program listing, everything we saved. And they were trying to show that we started with something half done. You know, rather than the listing showing progressions of writing the code and making changes and adding all this stuff. And they were trying to prove that we had started with this thing. And um, so they, they got all of our program listings in discovery, and they had to give them to an expert. Well, where do you find an expert on video games and how they're developed? They gave them to Brad, who worked for Atari, designing games. And I thought, wait a minute, you're giving him all of our code. <laughs> And I thought it was going to be a real pain. Instead, he turned around and said, yep, this proves it. They didn't take anything. <laughs> so it was just kind of funny. They used their own guy, and their own guy said what the truth was, and uh, you know, it all worked out well. But I just thought it was a little strange, giving our code, our source code, <laughs> to the other guys. Well, it was interesting, of course, Brad Stewart, who is in the back there, uh, was my right-hand guy when I was the manager of Atari. So Brad was in a very key position and to, uh, to, to not, know, well, not only know everybody, but to kind of know all the company secrets and all the rest of it. And so we, of course, hired Brad, you know, at Magic, you know, shortly thereafter also. Um, so uh, it's, it's kind of incestuous business. <laughs> well, Bob Whitehead's back there, too. Bob's back there. Bob, stand up. Hey, hey. Bob, stand up.
talking about all the eight by eight pixel patterns? Oh no, this is this, well, this, this is, that's that's where I was in. I was also the star witness on that <laughs> that particular lawsuit. Actually, what happened is Mattel attempted to do at one point, uh, you know, basically copyright all the possible uh, uh, implementations of a running man in an eight by eight grid, you know, which was apparently stupid. I mean, because basically there's only you know we all have the access to the same eight by eight grid. And, you, know, you can't just like trademark every possible you know pixel combination. So um, uh, yeah, I was actually starting from this in that lawsuit that got that was thrown out against you know uh, Mattel attempted to copyright that and we ended up you know uh, negating those those copyright you know things and that sort of stuff. So yeah, it was all there was always lawsuits going on back in those days. Always. <laughs> yeah, we hired a guy out of Atari named Mike Lorenzo who did point for us and we did some other games at Atari. We found two eight hundred. And he was actually threatened by Atari's attorney when he left that he would never work in the Valley again if he went to Activision. You have to realize this. Mike Lorenzo is about 6'3", 400 pounds. Atari's attorney was threatened. He about 5'4". <laughs> 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 I think they did uh, rigorous research. Uh, we went to a, a law firm. Jody Kira left the target before we did. We started a new company. Joe was uh, one of the primary designers of the UCS. He hired a firm called Wilson Sotsini to start his new company. And uh, we decided to use the same firm. But he immediately started hooking us up with a senior uh, corporate management person. was Jim Levy. And Jim was already in discussion with Sotsini. They did uh, you know, extensive due diligence. They talked to us about research and category. You know, we all thought it had a great future, so we were happy with it. Well, the fact of the matter is, venture capitalists did not invest in software back then. This was very new, and it was a very uh, big, it was a difficult road that we paved, and we didn't know that at the time. It didn't seem that hard because there had been some work done before by Jim Levy. He was already talking about them, talking with them about a software venture. Um, but to a venture capitalist, there's no better deal than to take a group of people working inside a company, doing one thing very successfully and not making any money at it, and putting them in another company, doing the exact same thing and making all the money. So, I mean, that's, that's basically number one for venture capitalists, is take something that is known, take it out of a company and put it into a startup. They were the first company that kind of really kind of embraced the concept of licensing and actually were extremely successful with it for the first couple of three years until they kind of overextended themselves. Um, licensing was not a big deal uh, back in those days. We were, you know, we were inventing the wheels. Let me put it in historical context. There was a period of time right before both companies started that there was a benefit to a license if it was an arcade game. So basically, you could see doing a home version of an arcade game because everybody had already played the arcade game and they would be pre-sold on the game. But we had pretty much finished that. I mean, we had caught up with the arcade games. We'd done all of them that could be done well on the 2600 by about the time we were starting these companies. So now there weren't any licenses that offered any pre-sale for us. And the idea of paying someone else for a license to try to increase your market share didn't make sense when we were the market share. I mean, there was nobody else out doing video games. So we do something cool and creative and it hits the shelves. Anybody who was buying video games would come running, hey, there's a new Activision game over at the store. And you know, it really didn't matter what it was. We could have put garbage in it. <laughs> we had to make them well good so that you would buy the next one. But it really did not, didn't require. Now, at, at some point, um, one, you know, we went to these trade shows I mentioned, the CESs. We actually went to two a year, one in January and one in June. In the six-month period between trade shows, we went from, there was Atari and Activision, to Atari and Activision and 30 other companies doing video games. 
remember that time there were 30 companies and they had all seen the success and they said, let's not use seasoned game designers as a magic did, let's just go out and hire some programmers off the street, put a couple million dollars in venture capital behind it, we want to get into this business. And you think Dave is exaggerating, I remember the CBS Quaker Oats was doing video games. <laughs> So these 30 companies all going to do these video games, and we looked at it, and we, we looked at each other, and we said, none of these companies are going to be in business a year from now. We didn't realize what that would do to the video game business. That's the big crash. That's a whole different story. But, um, you know, basically, the, at that point, when you've got all these companies putting out these products, now you need to differentiate yourself in the market. You know, certainly you can do a cool new game and you can market it and people will play it and then word of mouth, they build it up. But when there's 300 games on the shelves, that's when you use licensing and, and, um, and you know, try to build on some pre-sold product that was from the films or something like that. But in the early days of Activision and Magic, there was really no need for that kind of marketing. It was actually very prohibitively expensive, too, because Atari was into licensing movies. They paid Spielberg over $20 million, or so they guaranteed him over $20 million for the ET license. And, you know, Magic and Activision still put up that kind of money. We have time for, like, one more question, and then you can wait. Yeah. What are some of the games that you're most fond of uh, when you think about having Korea in the which ones do you, do you, did you enjoy the process and the game the most? Well, I can start and go down the line. Go ahead. Hey, uh, my favorite game, my game favorite game I ever played was Atlantis on the 2600. I just uh, had a lot of fun process of creating it. It came out nicely, graphic, all the rest of it. I have fond memories of that. We had a big contest in Bermuda for, you know, the, the Basically, we brought people in from all over the United States, you know, they won, you know, some kids, you know, basically to play the game. So that's the, the best members I have are that one that I created, so. Uh, I remember the first game I worked on, Barnstorming. I had come from a hardware background, didn't even know what software was. And can you imagine today people getting degrees in computer science? I mean, that, that just amazes me. I, I took the manual home over the weekend, I think it was about four pages and memorized it and came back a programmer. There were only five instructions you had to know. <laughs> my little pad of paper, and I was writing code. And of course, Dave, too, explained every step of the way, okay, this is how you draw a pixel. This is how you make something move left to right. And so uh, it, it was a fun process because I was learning as I went along. Um, I, we can do one more question. I thought I was going to keep going. Keep going. Oh, oh, hey, hey, oh. Sure. <laughs> But I mean, I, I have favorite stories, but um, it was really the time that was my favorite. We had, you know, four than five guys working in an open lab. You know, we didn't have offices where you close the door and separate yourself out. Everybody just worked together. And it was kind of a um, an unwritten rule that if you were rolled up to your terminal and concentrating, nobody said anything to you. And if you wanted to be part of it, you simply lean back and roll back. Now you're in this cubicle. <laughs> and, and you could give it. So you know, oh, that's a stupid looking bird, you know, whatever. And, and everybody would make comments. It was still the ultimate responsibility of the single programmer to accept or deny those comments. You know, you can make all the comments you want. I'll take them only if I like them. Um, but it was, you know, it was a really good, you know, camaraderie. There was a time later, after we were up to about seven or so, we had Carol Shaw. And um, Carol was working on River Raid and sitting clear at the far side of the cubicle. And she said, I need to make a sound for when I'm running out of gas. And I was not concentrating on my game at the time. I was kind of leaning back and I said, well, here's what you do. And I called out about seven lines of code to her and she typed it in and it goes, Rrr, Rrr. <laughs> that, that sound. It was just a lot of fun to actually be so into something that in the middle of nothing, you know, just sitting there, you could actually write a, 10 lines of code, goes into somebody else's game, they type it in, they run it, and there it is forever, you know. Just a fun time. <laughs> I agree with Dave. Uh, my personal most fun game to develop, I think, was the ice hockey cartridge because I was able to build off the tennis game. Uh, so that, that had a nice advantage for me. But my favorite games are other people's games. I love playing uh, Bob's boxing game and Frostbite. It's my personal favorite that Steve did. So 
I love being a part of the creative effort to create those games, even though I was not the author. But we get to comment, we get to play, we, get, we intensely play each other's games and, and comment. For me, it would have to be Dragonfire, uh, in, the, in my 2600 work anyway, just because of the technically challenging fun. It was, it was pretty different from anything that was out there. And like everybody says, we, we, the environment was so much fun. It was, it, we, we liked coming to work in the morning. It was just the way it was. I, uh, Dragonfire uh, was one of my favorites. I, I guess later when I uh, worked with the James White Sims with uh, Electronic Arts, uh, one of the ones I kept looking back on and being continually impressed by was, uh, was Bob's work on Star Voyager because it was trying to put a, a flight sim uh, on the 2600. And that's how they all have done it better. About six months before. <laughs> uh, to, to commemorate that, uh, but, uh, about 23 years, let me just get around a little bit a second. Uh, uh, now, 23 years later, uh, after being lost in space and in my attic, uh, the, uh, the starship uh, Star Voyager uh, has actually found its way back into Cosmos <laughs> to its maker, Bob Smith. And so I wanted to uh, not only clean my attic, but uh, return to him. <laughs> So they actually bought three or four bottles, four pieces from them, put it together, and then shot their cover. <laughs> and that is ultimately why uh, a magic was better than activation. <laughs> Uh, the, the game that I, um, I think about, it was one of the last games we worked at on uh, at Magic. Um, we worked with Mark Klein on this, and uh, it was called Touchdown Football, and it was uh, made for the Peanut, which was the PC Junior. It was a small little tiny computer that was going to revolutionize the industry, and of course it was never released. The more they released and sold five, I'm not sure what happened. It was released. But, uh, yeah, I guess it was released, but uh, we didn't, uh, I, I don't think we sold much. I, I don't really remember, but it was, uh, we, we had a, a lot of fun making that game, and uh, it later on inspired a trip to uh, get into football and ultimately uh, paved the way for uh, John Madden football. So, uh, a lot of fond memories working on that one, and uh, it was, uh, I like sport games myself, and I've worked on a lot of sport games, uh, and uh, you know, we innovated some of them at, uh, at Magic on the television, and uh, but that game, uh, because of the fun that we had working on it, and, um, and how it turned out, it was just a really fun little game, and uh, that one's always got a soft spot in my heart. Um, well, I think that is our time, and that wraps it up. Um, I want to thank all of you gentlemen for being here today. Uh, when I was losing myself in my handheld, I hope I, I certainly hope I didn't sound uh, flippant in any way, because I, I really wanted to get all the information down to treat you guys with the respect that you deserve. I'm really glad that everybody came out here for this. Um,